Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continuing on our module on the basics of Buddhist and uh, Jain architecture. So, so far we have covered the basics of Buddhist architecture in its, uh, in its initial stage and how it had flourished in the Indian subcontinent and uh, today we will be looking into the, 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 some of the basics of the uh, Jainism, their impact on the sculpture making and architecture making in the Indian subcontinent. Now, the idea of Jainism uh, and this, this religion which has been there in the Indian subcontinent and which is believed to be there at least since the 2000 BC. So, it is one of the oldest surviving religion in the Indian subcontinent. However, we also <coughs> we do see that I mean the, these ideas about um, Jainism that had also their uh, similarities and dissimilarities with what we see in terms of Buddhism. Now, some of the, uh, the in, in terms of the Jainism, what we find the most important part is this idea of Jinnah or the liberated one and that is how this entire religion came into uh, known as Jainism. So, the, the Jinnahs or the liberated ones who are free from the cycle of birth and rebirth and they are the ones who uh, know the universal truth. So, uh, for them what we find there is that how um, the Jinnahs, they they have been there, they are aware 23 of these jinnas, they, they are, they are also known as the Tirthankaras. So, they have been there before the birth of Buddha. So, the, the last uh, Tirthankara who was there before the birth of Buddha that was uh, Parshvanath in the 8th century, in the 8th century BC and then the one who was there who was contemporary of Buddha and there had been accounts in which we find that there had been debates or discussion sessions in which both Buddha and this Jaina Tirthankara, the last of the Jaina Tirthankaras were, were present and so in that particular context we find the Jaina Tirthankara who was um, a contemporary of Buddha, the last uh, Jaina Tirthankara, he was Mahavira. So, we find that I mean the, uh, the spread of Jainism, uh, it was in to some extent that I mean the early phase of Jainism, we find that they had their prominence in the places like in Bihar, in parts of northern and central India and we also see with time that there had been a significant presence of Jainism and not only in north and central India, but also in the western India as well as in, in, in the southern India. Now, some of the things that we find to be really interesting uh, features as part of the Jaina figures, for example, the one we have here uh, on screen and so there is one the figures, for example, the Tithankaras that we have here. So, in that case we have uh, certain particular uh, features of them which are as part of their body and that makes them distinguishable from the other Tithankaras. So, for example, the, all the Jaina Tithankaras we find them to be either seated or um, on, in the standing um, um, posture, in the Samavanga posture in which we find that I mean they are standing um, uh, vertically straight forward without uh, leaning in any other direction or uh, having any other gesture. So, in that case we find that I mean they, they are the ones, these Jaina Tithankaras, uh, they are uh, represented that way and usually they are represented as nudes and be, that is because that we find that I mean there are where three of the uh, prime uh, concepts which are at the core of the Jaina beliefs and that is to with non-violence, with uh, abandonment, 
and with non-attachment. So, we can imagine that I mean how the and, uh, this abandonment, abandonment of the material life and that that makes an impact on these figures that the figures are not associated with any kind of ornaments, they are not associated with royal robes or any other different kind of textiles or anything else they are not attached to any kind of material pleasure. That is the reason showing them to be stark nude is part of the larger concept of their ideology. Also that the idea of non-attachment is something that is very important in the Jaina belief that we find that this uh, the liberated ones or the jinnas, they were not attached to the material world as well as the, uh, they were not attached in terms of how um, the human relations work. So, that is the reason they have been shown as this singular figure who are, um, who stand tall or if they are seated in a position, they are uh, engaged in the meditative process and they are not attached to anyone else around them. So, these are some of the ideas that we find that how these overarching themes in Jainism also make their impact on the sculptures that we find from the Jaina con context. Now, some of the other things that even though these are some of the basic characteristic features of the Jaina figures we find across the subcontinent, there are also some of the things in which we can distinguish one Tirthankara from the other. And those are some of the uh, issues that we can see here. So, for example, here we have an image of uh, Tirthankara Rishavanatha and uh, this, this particular figure that comes from Chaucer in Bihar and that perhaps was made somewhere between 2nd and 1st century BC. In this one what we find that there are those open locks of hair that is represented uh, on Rishavnatha. So, this locks of hair is something that is associated with Rishavnatha and no other Tirthankaras. So, when we see these open locks of hair, then we immediately understand that this is the figure of the Tirthankara Rishavnatha. Then there is also another sign which we find, I mean here around this place and that is considered to be the Srivatsa sign and uh, that is also a very important mark of their divinity in the Jaina context. So, uh, those are some of the uh, signs or the iconographical features that are very much part of the Jaina sculptures that make us, that make us um, understand how these sculptures are made in the Jaina context and not in the Buddhist context or in the Hindu context. Now, from there I wanted to show another image that is there in the right side of the screen. Even though this image comes from much later time and that is perhaps from 9th to 10th century AD, but I wanted to show this image to have a sense of how this iconographical trades they work. So, for example, here we have this particular image which looks very similar to to how Buddha's image is made and we have already seen the images of Buddha who is seated in this Padmasana position or this cross-legged position in a meditative gesture and then with uh, sometimes with, with the hands um, you know uh, in the Avaya Mudra or in the meditative gesture for example here the way we see it or um, of course that I mean how there are some of the other signs which also can be confused with the sign of Buddha. So, for example, how the, the coiled hair that we have here and then there is a bun on the top of his head. So, these marks can also be confused with Buddha, but the thing is that when we see it is also associated with this seven hooded snake then we know that this is mark of Parshvanatha. So, Parshvanatha was the uh, Jaina Tirthankara who was uh, active in the 8th century BC and Rishavanatha was the one who was the first Jaina Tirthankara. So, what we have here that I mean even though there are some of the signs or even though there are some of the iconographical features which might seem a bit confusing with uh, the Buddhist signs, but this small uh, traits. So, for example, how each of these Jaina Tirthankaras will be associated with um, you know each of these signs for example, the matted locks or uh, this seven hooded snake 
those are the ones through which we can understand that these images are made in the Jaina context and not in the Buddhist context. Also this Srivatsa sign that we have spoken about that is there in their chest that marks their divinity in the Jaina context. So that is also something not uh, present in the Buddhist context. Now the Buddha's urna or this particular mark in his forehead that is also something that we do not really see to be part of the, um, the Jainas but sometimes I mean there will be a mark of an eye that will be represented. Now the other thing that we also find to be which can be a distinguishing mark from the um, Buddhist sculptures and that is that the Jaina sculptures in all these uh, contexts we find them to be always nude. So, in terms of Buddha we find that I mean he always wears the, uh, the monk's robes, the robe which flows from one of his shoulder keeping the other shoulder bare and then like this very simple robe of a monk which we find to be not only there in the Buddhist context but also in the Hindu context. But in this case in the Jaina context we find that I mean they are usually stark nude. Now the other thing that we find that with time they, there have been the attendant figures and so on they had been um, joined by the, by the sides of this of the Jaina figures. However, we see that I mean this idea of uh, non-attachment of this Jaina figures to be prevalent in the way they are not attached to any of those material happenings or the happenings around them in the sculptures as well. So those are some of the signs in which we can distinguish them from the Buddha sculptures or from the Hindu sculptures. So in terms of some of the early uh, traces of the Jaina uh, architecture that we find that I mean they had also developed as rock cut architecture in many of these places and here we have images from this site of Udayagiri in Odisha and that developed somewhere between 5th century BC to 2nd century AD and uh, we know that I mean this was a site of pilgrimage and uh, as we can see that I mean there, there are those living rock structures. In the left side of the screen we find that there were those rock structures already existing which were carved and those series of those pillars to make a colonnade or like a uh, covered uh, pavilion or a veranda was made. And then uh, uh, there, there were those individual cells for the monks and the nuns, those were made and of course there were also places for, uh, um, for the visitors or the pilgrims, those were made and then there were also some of the sites where we find that the prayer halls where all the monks and the nuns would gather during the prayers, those were also made. So this is something that we find that uh, uh, how, how this, the making of these structures that had uh, their roots in, uh, in this earlier times, perhaps something that predates Buddhism that was also there in Jainism as well to make use of these existing structures and then um, carving them out to make um, places of habitation for the monks and the nuns and the pilgrims. So again these structures are made from stone but they are not really built for the royal people, they are not really built as palaces but they are built as monasteries something that we have also seen in the Buddhist context. And then there are some of the uh, details of the sculptures that we find. Um, so for example, here we have this uh, Rani Gumpha or cave 1 from which we have that I mean the images that those are uh, featured there in this uh, rock cut shelters or this rock cut um, sites where the, some of the contemporary events those are depicted. So this particular images they come from 2nd to 1st century BC and they are very surprisingly even though the sites were made for Jaina pilgrimage or for the, for the monks and the nuns there are some of the narrative panels in the horizontal panels we find that there are some of the scenes in which the warfare and the mighty deeds of the kings th those were also um, carved out. So in a way we can understand that I mean how religion and the spread of religion is never independent of the socio-political and cultural context during their own times. So how the, the patrons of this 
rock cut caves and the shelters. So, they have also uh, made an impact of their own deeds and their warfare, their achievements in the sites of pilgrimage as well as practicing uh, religion. This is another image from the, uh, uh, the site of Khandagiri. So, Khandagiri and Udayagiri, these two places are uh, neighboring sites in uh, Odisha. And this site we find that um, here there is an image from uh, cave 2 and um, the, the, that comes from 1st century BC. And then uh, we, what we have here really interesting is that how these individual cells as I have mentioned earlier for the monks and the nuns to stay inside and uh, I mean to take shelter and as well as perhaps continue their daily activities and their education and things like that. And how these individual cells they do not have much of decoration inside, but how the outer walls are made that also bear some of the references to this trifoil arch motif that we have studied in the Buddhist context so far. So, this particular arch motif that first we have seen in the Lomash Rishi cave in Bihar and then we found that how that arch motif also became really significant in terms of the Buddhist art and architecture. So, this is also something we find it was developing simultaneously with the Buddhist art and architecture. So, uh, one thing we can find that how the uh, architectural motifs, those were there uh, that were present during this time period like the 3rd century, 2nd century BC and so on, they were not really specific to one religion, but they were there used by different uh, groups, different communities and uh, both Jainism and Buddhism, they have incorporated particular kind, this particular architectural motifs as part of their structures. So, as we have already spoken about this this trifoil arch motif and or this chaitya archway which it came into being and this is something that we have seen in the Lomash Rishi cave. Later on we have also seen how that was also reflected in the Karla and Bhaja caves and here we also see them in the Jaina context in Khandagiri. And then in the uh, in the panel which is there on the top of the doorways, there we find some of the images of the gods and goddesses. So, for example, here in from the Ananta Gumpha or cave 3 in Khandagiri, in the right side of the screen we have image of Gajalakshmi. So, Gajalakshmi is a goddess who has been also revered in Hinduism and um, in the Hindu belief and she is also someone who is associated with prosperity and life and fertility and so on those in the Jaina context. So, that, so we find that I mean there is this figure of Gajalakshmi who is uh, uh, represented here in the frontal form only the, the deities or someone who is highly significant they are represented in this kind of frontal form as we have also seen in the figures of Buddha or or um, uh, the Jaina uh, Tirthankaras. So, we see that I mean there is uh, the figure of Gajalakshmi who is uh, at, at the center of this particular uh, panel and she holds the lotus stems and from which the lotuses are blooming and there are also many other lotuses that we find around her. So, it is basically it is a stylized representation of a lake full of lotuses and then there are two elephants by both her sides who are showering uh, water in a way to welcome her. So, that is the reason this association with the elephant or Gaja that comes into this name of Gaja Lakshmi. So, these are some of the characteristics we find that I mean how there are particular uh, figures in terms of the gods and goddesses who are relevant not only in the one religion, but in several religion, in multiple religion as so as the architectural motifs like this Chaitya motif or this trifoil arch motif which was first seen in the Lomash Rishi cave and then of course, in, in the Buddhist context and in the Jaina context and perhaps this kind of developments were simultaneous. It was not really like how the, it was not really like whether the Buddhist uh, predated the Jainas or the Jainas did it first and then the Buddhist, but perhaps these things continued simultaneously.
From there we also uh, have um, another site which is also highly significant and that, uh, that particular place is called Kankali Tila and uh, this is a site which was developed in the 2nd century BC which is very close to the uh, place of Mathura and there the excavations and uh, this name of Kankali Tila that actually came into being from this temple which was dedicated to Kankali or the fierce um, uh, manifestation of the great god is Kali in the in the later times, but this was a site where this uh, a Jaina stupa was there in the second century BC or so on. So we have an image of its excavation in the 19th century that is there in the left side of the uh, of the screen, and in the right side we have one of the panels which are found from this site that that shows a representation of the stupa. And this panel which is now um, you know it, it is kept in, in a museum in Mathura that shows this that has the Brahmi script in, in its lower part of it and here and then it also shows all the architectural details of a Jaina stupa. So, unlike the Buddhist stupa in which what we found that how the Buddhist uh, uh, the relic of the Buddha was kept in the stupa and uh, that, that was the site of veneration that developed. In, in terms of the Jaina stupa we have that how the, uh, the stupa became a mark of the Mount Meru. So, the Mount Meru uh, is also considered to be the, the center of the entire universe and this is something that is believed both in Jainism as well as in uh, Hinduism. So, the stupa became a sign of the Mount Meru and that is something we find that even though there are some of those structural similarities here the stupa structure we find and there are some of the celestial uh, women uh, th they are represented who sort of support this stupa structure also they show the importance of this particular structure and then we also have how this is uh, situated on a higher platform something that we have also considered in the Buddhist context that how if a structure is not really uh, situated on the ground but in on a higher platform that shows its religious as well as spiritual importance. So, something that we also see it here as well and then it is not only just that, but we also find the kind of railing which uh, surrounds the stupa that also goes very similar to what we have seen in Bharut or in Sanchi with the horizontal bars and those vertical columns how they sort of intersect and make this really interesting railings. Now, another characteristic feature we also see here are the are those elaborate gateways that is also something we have seen in Sachi and here we see that I mean how this elaborate gateways they also follow very similar kind of programmatic that we have seen there but they also bear some of the very significant symbols from, uh, from the Jaina context that make them distinguishable from the Buddhist structures. So, these are some of the exchanges we can talk about that how certain kind of architectural uh, motifs were there and how those architectural motifs actually were not specific to one religion, but several religions and stupa is one of the um, examples of that and the other one we have already spoken about and that is the one we see in this trifoil arch motif. So, another uh, Jaina site a very important one in southern India will be the site of Shravana Velagola and Shravana Velagola is the site which perhaps developed during the 3rd to 2nd century BC. As we know that this is also the site where the Maura em Maurya Empire, Emperor uh, Chandragupta Maurya had relocated. So, uh, Chandragupta Maurya was grandfather of Emperor Ashoka and after he retired from his uh, responsibilities as a ruler, then he relocated to this southern uh, state, uh, this southern site of, of Shrabana Velagola which is in southern Karnataka today. So, in this place what we find that I mean there was already this hill site and uh, perhaps there was already some significance of the Jainas here and with Chandragupta Maurya's arrival 
the importance of this site grew further and further. So here in the left side of the screen, we have images of this small rock shelters in the Chandragiri cave and Chandragiri was this particular hill was also named after Chandragupta Maurya. And then in the later times, we find that this Shravana Velagola, this, this site that had developed into a much larger temple complex and there is a temple for people to gather there and pray, but also there are monasteries, there are places for uh, educational activities and the other ritualistic purposes. So uh, this is how we find that, I mean, a site this of Jaina veneration that had developed during this 3rd to 2nd century BC and that continued to be um, in, in practice in the much later times as well. And um, later on, much later, we find that I mean this mighty sculpture of Gomateshwara that was added to this complex of Shravana Velagola on this on this hillside. So that also that added to this the, you know the significance of this site and also how um, the the pilgrims uh, interaction with this site had developed further and further with time. So from there, if I come back to some of the uh, common characteristic features of this of what we have studied so far in this module, we can say that there have been some of the uh, crucial features of this architecture starting with this trifoil arch motif, start uh, also with the stupa and how this particular forms in architecture, they are not just significant for one particular community or in one context, but they had their significance in a much larger scale. And that happened perhaps because of the power of this architectural uh, structures uh, as well as these forms which, uh, uh, which transcended the religious uh, boundaries and their importance was revered, their importance was acknowledged by the people not only from one religious background but from several religious backgrounds. And this is also to something that, I mean, uh, it, it ran into the discussion of our, um, uh, of, of this module, but I mean, perhaps it was not been explicitly addressed that how there have been an importance of the hill sites, a uh, site which is perhaps slightly upper from the regular ground level and how those hill sites or something that is like a plateau or something like a stupa which basically means like a piled up form that become very important in terms of uh, understanding this, this religious belief and philosophy. So how this particular form uh, which had its relevance in both in Jainism as well as in Buddhism, we find that how this forms, they, they already had this particular uh, form or this structure which perhaps uh, made the practitioners both in this religions to think about their importance in a much more in a symbolic way or to take them in the realm of philosophy. So that is how we find that I mean even though that architecture and sculpture making is something that is happening uh, with material, with our hands, with our eyes, but I mean they, they always have their relationship, they have always their deeper meanings into how they relate to this religious ideologies, the philosophy and the underlying meanings. So that is how the, the symbols, the structures, the forms, the materials and the community lives are interwoven into the study of art and architecture in the Buddhist and Jaina context. Thank you.